um, dear friends, uh, uh, it is a pleasure for me to be in another Zoom program. And it seems that uh, still we are facing geographical distancing from each other because of this COVID-19, but I'm sure that our hearts are uh, close uh, together. Um, the topic for this discussion is the Baha'i view on wealth and happiness. And I'm going to discuss that in three sections. Uh, we are going to look at the concept of wealth and, and true wealth, and also the concept of happiness and true happiness, and then combine these together and see how an ideal uh, life uh, looks like. So uh, let me just uh, share my PowerPoint with you, and then we start uh, with, uh, with this PowerPoint. It just take a couple of seconds. Um, sorry. Yes. All right. So uh, before I start, I have to mention a couple of points, uh, uh, especially for friends uh, who are not much familiar with the Baha'i faith. Um, it is important to note that uh, economic ideas are always a product of their own time and, and place, and, and therefore economics is an important feature of the Baha'i faith because Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of this faith, appeared in a time of uh, global economic integration. Uh, therefore, uh, we see uh, more materials uh, in the Baha'i writings on this subject compared to other major faiths. And this is due to the timing of the appearance of, of the Baha'i faith. And at the same time, it is important to note that the Baha'i faith is not an economic system. And the central figures of the faith never claimed to be technical economists. Uh, the main focus of the Baha'i scriptures is the application of spiritual teachings to solve economic problems. The Baha'i writings provide a framework that is considered a guideline for the design of uh, an economic system uh, for the future. Also, this presentation, presentation is a very brief discussion uh, on this subject. And those friends uh, that are not familiar with this topic and with the Baha'i faith, uh, please contact your friends uh, for, for more information. My main aim in this presentation is to establish that according to Abdul Baha, one of the central figures of the Baha'i faith, he is the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. He states that we must all be in the greatest happiness and comfort. There are so many of these images on the internet and showing the abnormal condition of our world today. One view or presentation or observation is that poverty and this kind of life was a normal condition in history. It is said that majority of people were poor over history. Uh, people had short lives, limited education, health challenges, poor nutrition, limited income and wealth, limited mobility, and many, many more problems. So the view is that over history, a good life, a comfortable life was abnormal. It is like war and peace. It is war that was a normal condition of life. The history of mankind is a history of war and we had peace for a short period of time here and there. Now, talking about economic challenges and difficulties of our time, the Universal House of Justice, the supreme institution of the Baha'i faith, uh, states, however much such conditions are the outcome of history, they do not have to define the future. 
and even if current approaches to economic life satisfied humanity's stage of adolescence, they are certainly inadequate for its downing age of maturity. Let's start saying a few words about the concept of wealth and wealth creation and true wealth. The Baha'i writings do not condemn wealth creation, but denounce wealth accumulation or when wealth is built up. It is wealth accumulation that does not allow wealth as an important resource to circulate into the economy and become the cause of more economic activities and therefore wealth creation. This slide shows that wealth is hugely accumulated in the hands of few. It shows that the number of people whose wealth is increasing. For example, in 2010, the wealth of only 388 people were more than all the wealth of the poorest half of the world's population. And as we see in 2016, the wealth of only 62 richest people were more than all the wealth of the poorest half of the world's population. Therefore, not only the number of rich people are increasing, but also the wealth of each person is increasing as well. This is the result of an uncontrolled, unrestricted, and unorganized economy we have today. Abdul Baha states in the future, there will be no very rich nor extremely poor. The famous saying that poor gets poorer and rich richer is no more valid today, at least in most part of the world. As we see in this figure on the right hand side, the poor are not getting poorer, but the rich are getting wealthier every day. In one hand, absolute poverty has declined in the last few decades, and on the other hand, the gap between the rich and the poor has increased. So our challenge today is how to eliminate extremes of wealth and poverty. Of course, by definition, relative poverty will be with us for a long time. Relative poverty is more cultural, is more political, spiritual, and material. The Baha'i work ethics do not condemn wealth creation. Wealth creation is appreciated if it is earned rightfully through honest work and is spent sensibly. In one of his writings, Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of this faith, states that having attained the stage of fulfillment and reached his maturity, man standed in need of wealth and such wealth as he acquired through crafts or professions is commendable and praiseworthy. This statement has important economic and moral implications. Baha'u'llah does not state that wealth is immoral. He rather accepts the need for it when a person reaches the stage of maturity. But we may ask, what is the stage of maturity? Well, each one of your friends may have a different view on this question. The stage of maturity can be viewed as when a person has developed intellectually and spiritually to a point when we are able to take on responsibility for ourselves and for others. So that the wealth earned through engaging in some sort of productive work can be spent sensibly and responsibly. Another view is that the stage of maturity will have an impact on a person to spend the wealth on those products that are right for human dignity. This would then inspire producers to produce those products 
that are demanded by responsible consumers. In fact, the level of maturity will inspire all the participants of the market to act responsibly. Therefore, the entire society will benefit when people reach the stage of maturity. And yet another way of explaining the stage of maturity is in relation to human inspirations and interactions and reciprocity and relationship. Economics is about connecting people. Relationship between consumers and producers, relationship between lenders and borrowers, between taxpayers and government, and between suppliers and manufacturers. The basis of any relationship should be maturity based on ethical values such as truthfulness and trustworthiness. We cannot measure these values with only price system and income. Similarly, in the following statement from Abdul Baha, describes how wealth should be acquired and how it should be spent. He said here, wealth is praiseworthy in the highest degree if it is acquired by an individual's own efforts in the grace of God and the grace of God in commerce, agriculture, art, and industry, and if it be expanded on philanthropic purposes. According to this passage, the first condition for acquiring wealth is that it must be earned by one's own efforts. This confirms the need to work and be a productive member of the community. The second condition is that the income earned be spent on charitable and philanthropic activities. This is an indication that the Baha'i community is directed towards attaining a culture of philanthropic, humanitarian, and benevolent activities. Now, let's say a few words about the terminology true wealth, uh, which is used here in this discussion, and is understood as a reunion between material and spiritual well-being to, to produce a perfect happiness. <clears throat> the Baha'i writings consider the dual nature of the human being, both spiritual and material. A balance is required. We are not simply economic man or machine. We have a higher purpose in life, and that is the acquisition of spiritual attributes. Therefore, material well-being alone cannot guarantee human happiness. For example, detachment from the material world is praised without disapproving one's material resources. This may seem contradictory as normally material wealth and attachment uh, goes hand in hand. The complexity arises when a person values material riches over and above a balanced life. So the concept of detachment is explained by Abdul Baha in these words. He said, Detachment does not consist in setting fire to one's house, or becoming bankrupt, or throwing one's fortune out of the window, or even giving away all of one's possessions. Detachment consists in refraining from letting our possessions possess us. About the concept of rich, Abdul Baha, sorry, Baha'u'llah, describes the relationship between human station and wealth in the following words. He said, I have created the rich and have bountifully shed my favors upon thee. And also he said, 
I created the rich. Why does thou bring thyself down to poverty? There can be several ways of explaining these passages. The concept of rich can be interpreted as both material and spiritual richness. One way of explaining I have created the rich is in respect of the use of abundance of goods and services that have been created for humans. In this case, we are created to be rich materially. Another way of explaining I have created the rich is in reference to humans' non-material richness. In this case, humans can grow up spiritually to use, for example, money as a means for higher purpose of life, such as serving the community or helping the poor. And a few words now about the concept of happiness and true happiness. Happiness, friends, is the object of all humans. It is also the object and desire of all the prophets of God to guide people how to achieve true happiness. Also, one of the most important objectives of every government is the provision of means for all citizens to be happy. But why, as people try more and more to acquire it, there is less and less success to achieve it? Happiness, as I said, is a relative condition and has a cultural element attached to it. It may be said that the first thing comes to mind is to have an adequate amount of income and wealth as a tool to become prosperous. Of course, factors such as food, water, and shelter are essential parts of a healthy physical life. Their fun function is to satisfy our physical body. If we consider happiness as feeling good and associated to a state of mind, then a good physical health would influence the state of mind and therefore happiness. However, material satisfaction alone cannot bring real happiness. Spiritual happiness or perfect happiness is an essential part of the whole package of happiness. Dear friends, there are hundreds of these images put on the internet by people, by governments, and non-governmental organizations and claiming that poor people are happier than the rich people. I don't know, friends, how you think about that and how you respond to this question. My understanding of poverty by living among many poor societies um, in our life is that in order to understand poverty, we have to live among them. Poverty cannot be defined and cannot be judged with pictures. We have to live among the poor people to understand the concept of poverty. We have to be able to feel it. To be fair, a number of questions should be asked when we are looking at these images. For example, might these children have been in front of a camera for the first time? Could the photographer have taken a picture before they posed for this photo? Could these happy faces be because of accessing food after a while? Do these children understand the meaning and the concept of health? and happiness and satisfaction. 
do these children possess what they need to be happy? Have opportunities be provided for these children to realize and experience real happiness? And if real happiness include both material and spiritual well-being, are these opportunities available to these children? So we have to make a distinction between satisfaction and happiness. The poor are satisfied with what they possess because they are not given the opportunity to ensure a better life. Being satisfied does not mean they are happy. A poor person living in absolute poverty may satisfy with one meal per day because he cannot get the second. Happiness requires more than the basic needs for survival. It requires proper education and health, employment opportunities, adequate housing and sanitation, and living in an accept accessible environment. To be fair, let's ask also this question. Are the rich people happier than the poor people? Well, I'm not going to judge the lifestyle of the rich people because happiness is relative. But at the same time, all of us may have the experience of seeing or knowing a rich person and always wished that all the rich people be like that person. Also, a number of studies have been done by, um, by organizations about the lifestyle of the rich people. And the findings shows that there is a paradox of income or wealth and happiness. The studies shows that that in one hand, people trying more and more to find happiness, and on the other hand, as they become wealthier, their level of happiness declines. In this section, friends, we are going to look at five different types of lifestyle. And um, we usually go through one or a combination of these uh, lifestyles. Uh, living in survival, living in comfort phase, living in moderation, living far beyond actual necessities. This is the statement from Abdul Baha, and living in seclusion. So we are going to say a few words about each one. First, living in survival, or what we call subsistence phase. This is where the basics and necessities of life are required for the survival. Abdul Baha here said that the needy shall have their necessities and no longer live in poverty. The United Nations characterization of survival stage and the accessibility of the basic needs of living includes five things. Food, clothes, shelter, good health, and adequate education. People who have less than these five are living in absolute poverty. Now, I'm going to introduce here uh, an economic uh, principle, and that is the application of the law of diminishing marginal utility. And friends who are listening to this uh, recording, I'm sure that uh, they are familiar with this uh, principle, uh, which was developed by the utilitarian and can be used nicely for the discussion we are having here. 
the law states that as people consume more of a good, the utility gained from each successive unit declines. It is stated that transferring money from the rich to the poor would increase the total well-being and happiness of the poor people. This is because the poor would get more satisfaction than the rich from each unit of money transfer. Now, some elements of this theory of redistribution are supported in the Baha'i writings. For example, it is stated that wealth is commendable if the whole society benefit from it. This view supports the utilitarian view of redistribution to increase the total well-being and happiness in a society. However, there are disagreements as well. The nature and the well-being and happiness need to be clarified. True happiness in the Baha'i writings include both material and spiritual. What is living in comfort zone? Living in comfort phase or sufficiency of basic needs. For this phase, it is stated that everyone has the right to a happy and comfortable life. A person may choose simple living for different personal reasons, such as health, an increase in quality time with family and friends, because of stress reduction, because of personal taste, a reaction to materialism and to support an anti-consumerist movement, or to support an environmentally friendly movement. So there are different ways and reason why a person or family choose to live in, in comfort zone or uh, a simple life. Uh, Shoghi Afandi here says that uh, living, uh, uh, simple living is not uh, living in seclusion. So the phase of comfort is the state of self-sufficiency and sustainability or a condition of true happiness. This is where individuals have the freedom to choose a level of happiness and well-being. Freedom to choose is a necessary condition for this stage, but not, of course, sufficient. Equal opportunity must be provided to all citizens to get the advantage of their own talents and capability. At this stage, people know that spending additional money in collecting more luxury does not necessarily add a higher return to happiness. Now, living in moderation. Moderation is another core spiritual principle associated with Baha'i lifestyle. A Baha'i view of moderation can be expressed as eliminating extremes of wealth and poverty. To create a balanced economy, the principle of moderation should be incorporated in all aspects of life. The practice of this principle maintains a balance in the material and spiritual lifestyle of individuals on one hand, and on the other hand, it can be a remedy to unsustainable social problems such as consumerism, which is one of the greatest challenges of our time in both developed and developing countries. The practice of moderation requires to be become 
uh, to become a norm, to become a way of life, and a part of the culture. And the best age to create this culture, this norm, is to start with the children. The next lifestyle is living in a face of what we call enough is enough, or far beyond actual necessities. This is the phrase, or this is the face that one is already satisfied and no more will be tolerated. Abdul Baha said here that it is evident that under present systems, and conditions of government, there are people more fortunate living in luxury and plenty far beyond their actual necessities. Spending beyond actual necessities or beyond the phase of enough is enough means that we are buying more luxuries and unnecessary products and possibly diminishing our further happiness. Beyond the phase of enough is enough, there is overproduction, which has led to consumer society and hence causing wastage of resources. The phase of beyond actual necessities corresponds with another economic principle or law that I like to uh, mention here and see how we can uh, use this principle for this discussion. And it is the law of diminishing marginal return, which states that as we consume more of something, our satisfaction diminishes or declines. Hence, if we are happy and satisfied with a certain amount of something, why should we go? for more. Let me say one example. If I'm happy, or let me say in this way, if I am hungry, the first plate of food gives me a lot of satisfaction. However, my happiness or my satisfaction declines with the second plate, and actually, I may hate the third plate of food. So the ethical part of this law states that if I'm happy with the first plate of food and satisfaction is guaranteed, why should I go for the second or third plate? In fact, stopping beyond actual necessities, which Abdul Baha said, means we are healthier and at the same time, saving resources for more deprived ones. And now, the idea of living or practicing uh, citizenship or seclusion, which is actually forbidden in the Baha'i writings. This kind of living is a kind of seclusion and characterized by abstinence from worldly pleasure as a lifestyle. Obviously, more human beings uh, to some degree experience uh, physical suffering throughout their lives. However, it should not be invited or made into a way of life. Of course, it is left to the discretion of individuals to decide based on their degree of moderation and detachment, as this may vary from person to person, from family to family, even from culture to culture. Explaining this, Shogi Afendi writes this, the standard inculcated by, by Baha'u'llah seeks under no circumstances to deny anyone the legitimate right and privilege to derive the fullest advantage and benefit from the manifold joys, beauties, 
and pleasures with which the world has been so plentifully enriched by, by an all-loving creator. Now we go to the next section and here a number of researchers have done a survey of religion on wealth and poverty and have come to this conclusion that there is more poverty in societies that are more religious. I have quoted here a couple of statements from researchers. One is from Jacob Lopana, who said that in Africa, the most impoverished people tend to be deeply religious. Another research is by Pippa Norris and Ronald Englehart, and they said that religiosity persists most strongly among vulnerable population, especially those in poorer nations and in failed states. Exposure to physical, societal, and personal risks drive religiosity. And an organization, Golab organization, has done some survey and research on this and have conducted a survey in more than 100 countries. And its findings shows that religion has a high connection with poverty. In other words, the more poverty a nation has, the higher is the religiosity in that nation. It also shows that in general, richer countries are less religious than the poorer one. On the left-hand side of this figure, we see that countries with around 90% of religiosity or more have less income and hence more poverty. And countries with around 20% of religiosity have a much higher level of income. But the question here is, is really religion a cause of poverty? Let's look at some of, some of the actual religious scriptures and see what they say about the value of wealth and happiness and poverty. I start with Jewish view. In Jewish view is that the way to help the poor is to become rich. It is said that we are on earth to experience and enjoy this life within the constraints of the law. It says that there is no virtue in poverty. Poverty is pointless suffering. Poverty is not admired. Wealth is commendable. And in the Christian belief is that wealth is not fundamentally immoral, but greed causes people to act in their own self-interest and distract Christians from helping the poor. And in Islam, it says that poverty is an evil. And it says that refuge to Allah from the evils of poverty and famine and deprivation. And it says that wealth in Islam is not evil, but if it is associated with greed, then it is viewed in a negative way. So, as we see, the Holy Scriptures actually condemn material poverty. And my humble opinion here is that there is a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of Holy Scriptures assuming that material poverty is admired and the view that those who become materially poorer get closer to God. Why God wants such a miserable life for one billion people of the world we are having today? The purpose of God by sending prophets of God, prophets are 
stated in this passage uh, from, from Abdul Baha. He said, God is not partial and is no respecter of persons. He has made provision for all. The harvest comes forth for everyone. The rain showers upon everybody. And the heat of the sun is destined to warm everyone. The virtue of the earth is for everyone. Therefore, there should be for all humanity the utmost happiness, the utmost comfort, the utmost well-being. But if conditions are such that some are happy and comfortable and some in misery, some accumulating exorbitant wealth and others are in dire want. Under such a system, it is impossible for man to be happy and impossible for him to win the good pleasure of God. Therefore, friends, it is not fair to say that religion is the cause of poverty. Reading the scriptures literally and its misunderstanding and misinterpretation can be one of the reasons for material poverty. But there are also other reasons, including economical reason, societal reason, political, educational, physical, mental, natural calamities that we have in places, civil wars, unemployment, bad decision making by, by leaders, corruption and injustices of all kinds and more and more are reasons for material poverty in different countries. On one hand, Baha'u'llah has given the responsibility to the wealthy to take care of the poor. He said that all rich ones on earth, the poor in your midst are my trust. Guard ye my trust and be not intent only on your own ease. And on the other hand, directing the wealthy people does not exclude the poor from taking responsibility of their own lives. Baha'u'llah here said that the poor may exert themselves and strive to earn the means of livelihood. This is a duty which in this most great revelation had been prescribed unto everyone. So friends, this may become a challenge actually for both the rich and the poor. The process of coming to a resolution requires a great deal of spiritual maturity on both sides. It is in this way that the society can function in a more secure and orderly manner. Of course, we cannot help the poor if we are poor ourselves. At the same time, it is important uh, becoming rich uh, with those characteristics we have in the writings. Abdul Baha in one of his writings states that, and I am uh, paraphrasing it, he said, when a rich man believes and follows the manifestation of God, it is a proof that his wealth is not a barrier and does not prevent him from attaining the pathway of salvation. So what should be remembered is to have the good characteristics of the poor, such as contentment, having a more simple life, modesty, loving people, satisfaction with little, and avoiding the negative characteristics of the rich people, such as greed and self-interest and self-love. The Baha'i writings clarifies this point by saying that taking care of the poor by the rich will be a gradual process. Here, Abdul Baha said the rich 
will come to this gradually, naturally, by their own volition. There are evidence in the Baha'i community that this gradual process is taking place. For example, the entire expenses of the activities of the Baha'i community at the global level are supported and paid for Baha'i, by Baha'is only. The global Baha'i community is self-supported financially. Another condition put forward in the writings of the Baha'i faith is for the rich to share their wealth willingly. Is for them to become more sensitive and show compassion towards others. Here, Abdul Baha said, the time will come in the near future when humanity will become so much more sensitive than at the present, that the man of great wealth will not enjoy his luxury in comparison with the deploring poverty about him. So perhaps there are several reasons that the rich countries are helping the poor people today. One is the increasing level of compassion by the rich people. Another is that the rich countries have realized that the problem of the poor countries will become the problem of the rich countries in the long run. So it seems that the rich and the poor are rehearsing of how to live together. They are practicing how to live together. This is a learning process that is taking place to shape an ideal living. Today, many of the rich share their wealth by being forced to give through a system of what we call taxation. And of course, many try to escape and avoid paying tax as much as possible. Now, but what is the Baha'i position on taxation as a method of wealth circulation and redistribution? A classic problem or view of the imposition of any tax is that it has a disincentive um, effect on effort and initiative. In the context of the Baha'i stand towards paying tax, uh, three basic principles should be considered. First, although people have the right to accumulate wealth and own property, the Baha'i writings encourage the rich to care for the poor and needy and share their wealth for the betterment of the community. Second, the Baha'i way of life is that able people should become productive members of the society. So irrespective of the level of taxation, all must be economically active. Abdul Baha in one of the writings says that all must be producers. Third, for a Baha'i, work done in the spirit of service is considered as a form of worship. Therefore, the imposition of tax will not be a barrier to work and serve the community, nor it will create a disincentive in a person. So the system of taxation will not have any negative effect on Baha'is to become a productive member of a society. And of course, governments have to do their own responsibility in an honest and just way to become a just government. But how is taxation as a compulsory policy different from voluntary sharing of one's um, possessions? It is vital to comment that 
all the activities of the Baha'i community worldwide are carried out only through the monetary contribution of individual Baha'is. This allows the Baha'i community to be function financially self-supported and self-sustained. The concept of voluntary giving is an indication that a community is advancing spiritually. However, on a national scale, the system of taxation and other government regulations may be more practical. This means it is too risky for a government to be dependent on voluntary contribution for the funds needed to spend on important public services. The Baha'i principle of voluntary sharing of one's wealth is an effective way of reducing or eliminating extremes of wealth and poverty. Voluntary sharing of one's wealth is considered to be more effective because it is a matter of free choice rather than giving by force. The circulation of money is crucial in many aspects of development. Here are three examples. Of course, there are many, many more examples. One, the role of money for the maintenance of Baha'i holy places, building Baha'i houses of worship, and different aspects of the progress of the faith. Second, the role of money in elimination of absolute poverty and providing an acceptable life for the poor. And third, the role of money in improving health and education. In the Baha'i community, money as a material means and in the form of voluntary contributions is circulating from the grassroots communities and circulating not only with the local communities, but also as a contribution to the national and international funds. And also it flows from the international funds towards the national and local communities when needed. Therefore, money is in circulation up and down. This increases economic activities by using physical and human resources within and outside the Baha'i community. So money is in circulation all the time, which results in economic activities. And the most important thing is, friends, that such circulation is that activities are based on the core spiritual principles. The activities are based on virtues that are taking place. So in conclusion, friends, what do we need to be happy? First, we need freedom. And of course, freedom have to be defined. We are not talking about any kind of freedom, but freedom within the law. Freedom, to be able to make the choice of what type of life and happiness we want to have. Then, having the opportunity to be able to discover and demonstrate our talents and our capabilities. And also with adequate means, the provision of means. Then we are able to achieve the kind of happiness we want. And a true happiness, of course, will be based on the core spiritual principles based on virtues. Therefore, friends, in order to produce a lifestyle, a happy lifestyle, I suggest we should have four things. One, the well-being and happiness for ourselves. Two, 
the well-being and happiness for others should be considered. Three, the well-being and happiness for the future generation must be in our mind. And also, number four, a friendly environment and ecological sustainability. So with these four principles, that we are having a good life for ourselves, a good life for others, a good life for the future generation, and of course, protecting our environment, then we can have a happy life. Well, thank you very much, friends, and I hope that this presentation helped. And uh, um, I say, uh, goodbye and have uh, and I wish a safe uh, a safe time within this during this problem of covid-19 that we are having thank you very much